Good morning, church. I am thrilled that you are joining us today. Let's take a moment and welcome anyone who is joining with us for the first time. Welcome to Summit Church. We love that you are here. We have a community that meets all over the world digitally. So welcome to this worship experience. It is so much more than watching a video on your mobile device, but connecting with others as we connect with God. So for those of you who are comfortable with chatting on our platforms, we want you to take a moment right now and help our guests feel welcome. Just introduce yourself. Let us know where you are viewing from. I also have a quick favor to ask you. If you haven't liked our Your Summit Church Facebook page, I want you to go like it. Here's why. Once you like our page, you can check in at church. You can share with your community what you're learning, what you need prayer on, and what Jesus means in your life. We are a community. We are here for each other, and we are so blessed that you are joining us today online. Let's get ready to worship.
Man, isn't that great worship? I love that worship song. I love it because it's just a declaration of who God is. And it's amazing what God can do. And so gather your family around real, real, real quick and, and get your sacraments out. And we're going we're gonna to take communion together. And, and, and you know what? When Jesus took the Passover with the disciples, and from that point we call it the Lord's Supper, when he did the Lord's Supper with them, what he said is, when you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And what he was saying is he was saying, remember what I did for you. Remember who I am. Remember what I did. Remember who you are as a result of that. And so when we take communion, what we're really doing is we're, take, we're making a de declaration of the way maker. We're making a declaration of who God is. We're saying he is is our way maker in other words there was no way for us to be in real true reconciled relationship with god because as men as fallen men marred by sin we could not be in that relationship with the holy god who cannot be in relationship with sin so jesus if you're ever wondering what that really means when someone says he's a way maker or he makes a way where there is no way it's not just talking about some miraculous thing in terms of some hardship you're going through it's talking about salvation it's talking about there was no way for you to be in relationship with god but jesus is your way maker he caused us to be back in relationship with God. One of the ways we know this is that when he finished what he came to do when he died on that cross, he said, it is finished. And the Bible records that when he said, it is finished, that, there, that the veil in the temple was rent from top to bottom. Now the veil in the temple was a veil that was in place in the temple between the holy place, the most holy place, and, and the holiest uh, of all. So you had the holy place where several priests could be, and then the holiest of all where only one priest could be. And once a year, a priest went into that place where the Ark of the Covenant it was, where the Shekinah glory of God would come down, and he would make sacrifice for people. And when he would make sacrifice, um, it would roll sins up. Well, what Jesus did was he was that perfect spotless lamb as well as our high priest, the Bible says in Hebrews. And when he went on that cross and made sacrifice of himself, he did it once and for all. See, that veil represented everybody can't come in here. You can't come in here and be in the Shekinah glory of God. You can't come in here and be that close to God because it would destroy you. Because just of who God is, it would destroy you. So what Jesus did when he made sacrifice for us, when we believe on him, it gives us the ability to be in relationship with God. Think about that. So when, God, when Jesus said, it is finished, I have paid the pe price of sin for humanity. If they'll believe on me, what the Bible says that veil was rent from top to bottom. In my mind, what that means is that God reached down into that temple and he ripped that veil up and he was saying to us, come on in my presence. And that's what the Bible talks about when it says we can go boldly into the throne room of grace in our time of need for mercy because we are no longer kept out. There's been a way made. Who made the way? Jesus made the way. I'm so thankful for that today. How about you? I'm so thankful that my sin has been dealt with. And because I believe on him and because he's forgiven me and because I live for him, I can be in sweet relationship with my Father God, my Papa God, and He can be in relationship with me. So as we receive this today, remember, He's your way maker. He made a way where there was no way. Father, we take this bread right now. We receive it. We believe it. We thank You for being broken for us, Jesus. And when we take this, we do it in honor of you and in remembrance of the fact that you made a way and you reconciled us back to God. In Jesus' name, we take it in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Lord, we thank you for your blood that you shed for our sins, which is truly the thing that created the path for us back to God. Because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. We don't have to make sacrifices anymore to roll sins up because your sacrifice did it once and for all. So Father, we believe you. We thank you. We remember. 
In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, you can receive. Let's worship.
Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Summit Church. We're so glad that you're joining us this morning. I am so excited to be bringing the word to you today. My heart is literally inspired. My spirit is energized to be able to bring the word to you this morning. I'm so thankful for the presence of God and everything that he does in us when we are in his presence. See, when we come to a worship experience, even when we're online, it's meant to be an experience. What do I mean by that? When we come into a worship experience, we come to experience something. We show up to experience the presence of God. And through that, we come to contribute by praising God. See, I pray that when you see us worship uh, on this stage at your home, wherever you are, whether you're in your car right now or you're sitting in your bedroom or you're in your pajamas in the living room casting this up to your TV, I pray that you get involved and realize that worship, when we get on this stage, is not an entertaining thing, but it's something where we're inviting you to join, join us in praising God. And so today, I'm just so thankful for the presence of God and what he's doing in and through our lives uh, as people of God and those who are a part of Summit Church. And if you're new with us today, we're so glad that you're joining us. We pray that you get connected to the family here. Let me tell you something. When you get involved in a church, uh, that loves people and here at Summit Church I'm so thankful for the people of God here because I've, I've personally I'm a pastor on staff I've personally been ministered to and inspired by the people of God who are a part of this church we have great people that are a part of this church we have great families that are a part of this church and I'm so thankful for that and if you would like to be a part uh, we have a number on the screen I'm sure you've seen it uh, that you can text to and we can get you connected uh, and we're so glad that you're with us today but today, we're going to be talking about the love of God. The love of God. What a vast subject. What a, a great deep ocean to jump off into this morning. The love of God. Who can comprehend it? The writers in the Bible said, who can even fathom the love of God? But today, I'm going to try to, um, through, through, uh, through God, through the power of his Holy Spirit, try to help us uh, shift our thinking when we think about the love of God. Because many times, I think through the experience of life, I think many times through the experiences of what we've been through up to this point, we tend to shift our thinking about the love of God. You know, in, in, in biblical terms, in the study, in study terms, in, in scholastic terms, it's called theology, the study of God. And many times, our theology, the way we think about and perceive God changes over time. You say, really, it does? Absolutely, it does. Absolutely, it does. And today, I want to get us back to centering in on what it means to be loved by God. Do you know you're loved by God this morning? Do you know that he loves you just as you are? That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us? That while you and I were still in trespasses and sin, that he sent his son? Before you and I could ever tell God we love him, he showed us that he loved us. Yeah, he's that good. He's that good and he wants to change our lives this morning. I want to open up with the passage of scripture really quick in Isaiah chapter 6 that just explains the awesomeness of the God that we serve. This is what it says, Isaiah chapter 6, uh, we're going to start in verse 1. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up. In the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it, it stood seraphim. These are angels. Each one had six wings, with two covering his face, with two covering his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. So I said, woe is me. This is, this is Isaiah. Woe is me for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin is purged. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, this is Isaiah, Here I am, send me. Here I am, send me. Isaiah is in a situation 
where his king Uzziah just died. King Uzziah just died. He, he was in reign for 52 years, many people believe. He was in reign for 52 years and then he died. Many people up to this point that Isaiah is interacting with, they only know King Uzziah as their king at the time, the one who sat on the earthly throne. But you and I today have a king that sits on a throne way above the thrones of the earth. We have a king that sits high above those who are in political upstanding power at this time, those the rulers of the nations at this time. Our God reigns sovereign over the nations, the Bible says. So today, if you have any fear in your heart, you can be just like Isaiah. When we come into the presence of God, many times we may feel lowly, but God says through the power of Jesus Christ, through what he did, we can come boldly now to the throne of grace. We can come boldly now. We can come boldly. And now he sees us as his son. Just as Jesus is seen by God. God has that same love for you and I. And when we come into his presence, we can come to know that our king sits on the throne. That's the God we serve today. And that's the God that loves you. And so let's pray before we get into our message today entitled, The Ones Whom Jesus Loves. God, we come to you this morning. We are so thankful for your power and your presence. God, we're so thankful that you are the supreme ruler over all. God, that you reign above the heavens and the earth. God, that the earth is your footstool and the heavens are your throne. God, we're so thankful that you have chosen us, God, to live in this time, that you are equipping us to be those who reach the world with the love of God. We thank you, and it's in his name we pray. Everybody said, amen, amen. Today, we're going to be diving in to this topic, the ones whom Jesus loves. This is a play on words, of course, if you've read your New Testament, that the disciple John referred to himself as the disciple in whom Jesus loved. The disciple in whom Jesus loved. And you and I today can have the realization that John did. You could find John uh, uh, sitting with Jesus on the, the, in the Last Supper, you can find him leaning on the chest of Jesus, one ear on his heart and one ear listening to his voice. And John is listening to the whispers of Jesus, the one we serve today. John is so close to him. You know, within the disciples, there's 12 disciples, but within that, there were three. And within that, there were one who was closest to Jesus, closest confidant with Jesus, and that was John. John was the one Jesus gave his mother to when he died. He said, behold, son, here's your mother. Behold, mother, this is your son. He told John, take after my mother when I go away. John was beloved by Jesus, and he understood that. And Jesus, because he understood that John had a revelation of his love for him, he was able to trust him. He was able to trust him, not only with the message of the king, he trusted him with his own mother. I really do believe when we come into a realization of understanding how much God loves us, that he then is able to trust us. Because when we understand his love for him, that is something that should empower us to live a life of holiness. That should empower us to live a life of holiness. When I understand that I'm accepted by God, that should push me on to good works. That should push me on to live a life for him. I'm a firm believer in this. And this is something God is revealing to me, and he's revealed it to me here recently, that before we can live a life of holiness, we have to allow the love of God to, to make us live a life of wholeness. We have to allow his love to be the salve, the balm that heals the inside of our hearts. See, many of us have broken places in our hearts today. Many of us do. We're, we're hurt, maybe a coworker. We're hurt maybe by a, a family member. We're hurt maybe by a situation. We're devastated maybe by a sickness that's going on in our family. We're devastated by the, the shadow and the effects of COVID-19. We may be affected personally with the sickness of COVID-19, the disease of it. But God, through his power, God, through his love, wants to come in and be the healing balm to your heart. He wants to come in and fix those broken areas. He wants to come in and give you the power to overcome those things. Amen? So we are the ones whom Jesus loves. 
You and I were created to love and to be loved. It is only by love that we can truly serve one another. He created us for the purpose of loving him and receiving his love. This is why God has created us. He created us to love and to be loved. Every one of us in our life in this moment loves something. You're giving your time to something. You're giving your resources to something. You're giving your talents and abilities to something. It may be an entrepreneurial effort. It may be personal ambition. It may be uh, something that, is, uh, that you, you see as noble and right. It may be to your kids. It may be to your spouse. All of these things, we love something within our life. And how many of you know love will make you do some crazy things in life? Love pushes us beyond ourselves. Love makes us believe we can do something above ourselves. Love helps us to sacrifice. Love is the driving force behind what we do as people, right? And God wants to fill us with his love, the agape kind of love, the unconditional love that forces us now because I understand he loves me, I can live a life full on for him. If we say he created us, Uh, to love him he created us for the purpose of loving him why would God ever allow the fall of Adam and Eve why did he allow Adam and Eve to sin why did he make it why why, why did he allow that to he didn't make it that way he allowed it to happen why did he allow it I want you to ponder this question suppose there had never been a fall of Adam and Eve then the most amazing, wonderful, inspiring, incomparable, indescribable, unfathomable aspect of the love of God would have never been known. That this holy, righteous, pure God, as we read about in Isaiah 6, would be able to love sinners. That a God of that great awesomeness in the true sense of the word, the God of that great power and sovereignty would be able to love sinners. Sinners like you and me, And so work in our lives now that we are transformed, that we are now saints, that we are now people who love God, that we're of the kingdom of heaven, that we're of the citizenship of heaven. That now because we're transformed, we would then be given the capacity to love him back. And then by loving him, we are truly able to love others. We're truly able to love others. You may be in your life right now, you may be in a situation where you say, Man, I'm having a hard time loving others. Let me tell you something. Allow him to give you the ability to love others. Allow him to lead you by the impulses of the Spirit. We're going to get into uh, uh, some of the texts that go along with this in a moment that reveal to us that God can give us the power to live by the impulses of the Spirit. What are the impulses of the Spirit? What are the impulses of the Spirit? We're about to find out. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but there's more to come. God doesn't want to just be our number one priority. He wants to be the priority. See, God is not confined to our boxes. God is not confined to our lists. God is not confined to our uh, mental capacity. God is above that. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. And thank God that's the case. Because now I have given myself to something that is greater than myself. And how many of y'all know it's an awesome thing to be accepted by something that's bigger than you? How many of y'all know when you have the acceptance of something that's above you? Let me tell you something. When I gained the acceptance of my wife, when, when she told me the first time she told me she loved me, I can remember, man, it was like the grass was greener. It was like the sky was more blue. It was like I could hear the birds chirping for the very first time. It's the same way with God times eternity times it all because God comes in and he he flips the script he opens up our eyes he allows us to see for the first time that what true love is what true acceptance is that I don't serve God trying to be accepted I serve God from a place of already being accepted that he's already accepted me in the beloved But will I allow myself to join myself with that in which he has said over me? The identity that he wants to put on me, am I going to agree with it? And am I going to live up to that identity by the power that he's trying to give me through grace? 
Many of us have heard the definition of grace, that God just winks at our sin and allows us to do whatever we want. But the word clearly states that if you love me, you'll what? You'll keep my commands. You'll keep my commands. See, grace is the divine empowerment to overcome sin. You say, Connor, I can overcome the things in my life. Absolutely, by the power of God. You ask him to get involved and watch, watch the temptation. Watch the things that have held you bound. As you begin to say yes to him, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something that revolutionized my life as a Christian and as a believer and as somebody that's in relationship with Jesus because this is not a religious obligation. This is an ongoing relationship that me and him have. And we talk about things. And he's my father and my king and my Lord and my master. And so we have conversations. See, it's a dialogue when we pray. I speak to him and he speaks back to me. But when I learned how to say yes to him, it got a whole lot easier to say no to things. What do you mean by that, Connor? When I learned to say yes, when I learned to pre-decide to say, God, whatever it means, whatever it takes, my answer in advance is yes. I don't even know what that means yet. There could be something God asked me to do that I'm scared to death to do. But my answer in advance is yes. I'm prepping my heart to say yes. God, you want me to give that up? My answer in advance is yes. God, you want me to do that? My answer in advance is yes. God, you want me to go here? You want me to do that? You want me to talk to that person? My answer in advance is yes. See, when we learn how to say yes to God, when we learn how to pre-decide, when we learn how to be rooted in the love of God, which will be in some of the texts we read in a minute, God gives us the power to live for him. Out of a place of wholeness do we achieve holiness. This is revolutionary. This is revolutionary. It's very elementary in the teachings of Scripture. It's very elementary in, in the life of the believer. But we have so forgotten about this that we're trying to strive to live for God and we're trying to work harder. And God's saying, if you would understand that I call you beloved, if you understand that I loved you so much and you don't have to come at me trying to be accepted all the time, but I've already accepted you. And if you would actually understand that, then you would begin to live in, in the place that I want you to live. Then you would begin to call up higher. See, when I, was, when I first got saved, when I first came to know Christ, it took people walking alongside me saying, Connor, you've got this. Connor, that's not who you are, man. Connor, God wants you to do something bigger. God wants you to be somebody. God wants you to be somebody in his kingdom. God has a great calling on your life. C Connor, God's called you to the nations. God, God's called you to do this. I, I, I allowed people to speak these things over me and I allowed people to get on the inside of who I, I allowed. I opened myself up to this. And let me tell you, I'm all the better for it because God placed identity on me by me joining myself to, to, the, to the thing, the instrument he has chosen to enact his kingdom in the earth, and that's the church. When I joined myself to his church, that's when things began to change. Of course, when I accepted Jesus, of course, when I was filled with the Holy Spirit, God changed my life. But let me tell you something, all that happened in one place, you guessed it, the church. The church, many of us, we have bought into this lie that we don't have to show up to church, that we can just have this experience at home. But are we reading our Bibles? Because the Bible says, do not forsake the assembling of yourself together, even as you see the day approaching. Let me tell you something. I see the day approaching. Let me tell you something. There are things happening in this world I can't explain. And I can, the only way I can explain it is I believe uh, G God is coming. And guess what? In his word 2,000 years ago, he said he was coming quickly. Let me tell you, he's been coming quickly for 2,000 years. So when we say we think God's coming, of, of course, he is. He is coming back. But I see something else. I see the earth groaning and travailing. And the Bible talks about that the earth... Uh, groans and travails for the manifestation for the sons and daughters of God. The earth is waiting for us as sons and daughters of God to step up and pick up the mantle God's called us to do, to, to love those, the brokenhearted, to take care of the widow, to look after the orphan, to take care of people who are in need, to preach, uh, to preach freedom to the sinner, to preach freedom to those who are held captive. 
Let me tell you something. If you feel held captive by religion this morning, by checking the boxes, by coloring inside the lines of what you believe Christianity to be, God's calling you to a relationship, to an ongoing relationship with him. It's so much bigger than a religious obligation. This is a relationship. He loves you. He loves me. And out of that revelation of knowing that, it inspires me to live for him. It inspires me to live for him. Through his love, he makes me whole. Through his love, he gives me identity. Have you allowed God to identify you? Have you allowed God to identify you? What do you mean, Connor? What do you mean by that? This is what I mean by that. God, when, when you mess up, when you sin, when, when you feel not good enough, God is not the one kicking dirt on top of you while you're down. God is not looking at you waiting for you to mess up, waiting for you to make another stumble again, waiting for you to fall back into that thing that's held you in bondage for so long. Let me tell you what God wants to do. He wants to put identity on you. And if you let God identify you, all the lesser pursuits of life will begin to fall away as you say yes to him. What do I mean by that? If you allow God to get on the inside of you and say, guess what? You've accepted my son, Jesus Christ. These are, this is for believers. This talk right here is for believers. You've already accepted my son, Jesus Christ, but you're not living like a son. You're not living like a son of the king. And guess what? Sons of the king don't do that. And guess what, son? I've called you higher, and I know there's more in you. And I know through my son, you're enough. And I know you can come to a place where you and I are so close together, this thing will fade away. This thing will fade away. The Bible talks about, if you seek, this is what the, the Lord says in Jeremiah, you seek after me, and when you seek after me with your whole heart, then you'll find me. You can't have a whole heart without Jesus. You can't have a whole mind without Jesus. What do I mean by whole? You can't be filled. You can't be made whole. You can't be made, you can't be made right without a relationship with Jesus. You'll seek me uh, and you'll find me when you seek me with all of your heart, with your whole heart. Let Jesus come and make your heart whole. Let him come place identity on you as a son of God and sons of the king only do what their father, the king, says. And I've already said yes to him. I've made my covenant to him. And so I'm going to live my life for him. See, in my marriage, my wife does not get my leftovers. I've, I've made it a point in our marriage. I, Taylor, you're not going to get my leftovers. Early on in marriage, you begin to figure these things out. <laughs> that man... Just coming into it halfway ain't going to work, bro. It ain't going to work. You got to bring your best. The Bible says to love your wife as Christ loves the church. And so I bring my best to her. I serve her without expecting in return. I don't wait for her to do something. I go ahead and do something for her. I I'm give of myself, man. Love makes me sacrifice for that girl. I'll go out of my way for her. I'll go buy her flowers on a day that ain't even her birthday. I'll go, I'll go do this, I'll go do that. I'll cook her a big old meal on a day she ain't expecting. And I've gotten better at this, praise God. But this is what I'm saying. Love makes us step out and do something above ourselves. And if we come into our relationship with, of, with God, giving him our leftovers, what does that say about how we feel about God? We know he loves us, right? We've, we've got that. We know he does. And out of that love, it's supposed to fuel our love for him. But if we're giving him our leftovers, what does that say about our, our, our relationship with him? That it's fizzled into a place of lukewarmness, right? And that we need to get right with him. We need to allow his divine empowerment to carry us. What does it mean to lean into God's divine empowerment? What does it mean? First, it means... Leaning into his son, trusting in his son to save you, first and foremost. Trusting in the finished work of Jesus Christ, that he was crucified, that he was put in a tomb, that he ascended into heaven. And now he's seated at the right hand of, the, of God, the Father, making intercession for me and you. That's the first 
realization that we have to come to. We have to trust in him and surrender our lives to him. The second, these are in no particular order besides the first one. You must do that first. Second, we must lean into the word trusting that it is my spiritual sustenance. This is also leaning into God's divine empowerment. The word, the Bible says, the word is a lamp unto my feet and light unto my path. How am I supposed to see around spiritually without the light? How am I supposed to go anywhere without a path? How many of y'all, I, live out, I lived out in the country for a long time. We lived out in the sticks of Texas. And if I ever took off into a field without a path, I was going to hit a mesquite tree stump. I was going to puncture a tire. I was going to mess up my shocks. I was going to mess up the alignment of my vehicle. It was going to be bad news. But when I had a path, when I had a path, I didn't have to worry about any of those things. The word is a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. His word will never fail. Second is leaning into prayer, realizing that it's not only my lifeline, but an invitation to commune with the one true God and my Father. Prayer is my opportunity to experience the love of God right where I am. I don't have to wait to pray in this building in the church. I can pray on my job. I can commune with God uh, at my house. I can commune with God wherever I am in my office, in my study, wherever I'm doing, whatever I'm doing, I can commune with God. It's not held bound by the, by the four walls of this church. You commune with God right where you are and watch him show up through prayer, through understanding prayer and communing with God and living for him. God will supply all my needs according to his riches and glory, living in his divine empowerment. Third, how do I lean into God's divine empowerment? I lean into this empowerment by leaning into the community of the church, realizing that it is not only the place I come once a week to check off the list of my spiritual and religious obligation, but it is the family of God. It is the family of God that he is calling me to connect to and to join myself to that will come alongside me, that will lift me and help grow me up in the things of God. The church the church saved my life. Jesus, uh, Jesus saved my life in the fact of eternity and following him has changed me forever. But coming alongside the people of God, joining myself up with the group of people, joining myself up with the very thing that God has set up to enact his kingdom into the earth. Come on, that's a big deal. Joining ourselves to that. When I join myself to that, that's where I understood what God had called me to. That's where I understood that the Holy Spirit could fill my life. That's where I understood that God was calling me higher. I can remember. See, this is what the love of God does. The love of God calls you up to a place you didn't realize you could go. The love of God comes and dusts you off when you're living rank, when you're living in sin. I can remember God calling my name and saying, Connor, <laughs> Connor, I know you don't see it yet, but if you follow me, if you seek after me with all of your heart, I'll meet you right where you are. I'll meet you right where you are. I'll reveal things to you you never thought would happen. I'll bring you to a place, Connor, where you're going to meet your wife. I'll bring you to a place where you're going to join up with a body of believers and seek after me and go after God and go after myself and, and push forward the kingdom. See, this is what God does when we get aligned with him, when we understand how much he loves us. But when I joined myself to the church, I can remember, I didn't have to hear the voice of God to do that. I didn't have to wait for somebody to, 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 to do something. Just, I just did it. I knew God wanted me to be a part of church. I knew that that was something he wanted me to do. So I obeyed. And on the other side of my obedience, God revealed these things to me. See, this is what the word says. The Bible says that God places the lonely in family. The lonely. There were times where I felt lonely in my Christian walk. I don't know if you've ever felt this way, where I felt alone. And God put me in a family. God put me in a family that placed identity on me from God. God given identity, placed it on me. And through that of knowing I'm beloved and through joining myself with this church, he changed my life. If you don't feel like you belong, if you don't feel like you're loved, you'll never get attached to God. 
I am seated in his love. I am seated in his grace and I am seated in his mercy. I'm seated in his favor and I am seated in his blessing and I am seated in his authority. The cross is the thing we look at to realize that there's nothing God wouldn't do to get to us. He did everything possible to reconcile us back to himself through Jesus and the victory of Christ. Through the victory of Christ. You know, many of us say, well, I know about the victory of Jesus. I know about what he did. It's one thing to know about God. It's another thing if we're experiencing that victory in our lives on a daily basis. It's another thing if we so experience the realization of how much God loves us in the victory of Jesus and what he did that we're able to overcome the things in this life that would hold us down and keep us from him. See, the victory of Jesus tells me that the things of this world cannot hold me down. Take courage because I've overcome the world and the one who has conquered the world lives within you and lives within me. And if you don't know him today, guess what? He wants you to come into relationship with him. And while you were still sinning, and while you may still be sinning, Christ died for you. And he wants you to know him today. He wants you to come into that relationship. He wants you to get caught in the swirl of love. He wants you to get caught in this swirl of love. He wants you to understand that you're beloved. He wants you to understand that you are his. Romans chapter 8. This is what it says. We got to get this. Romans chapter 8, we're starting in verse 14 in the Passion Translation. The mature children of God are those who are moved by the impulses of the Holy Spirit. And you did not receive the spirit of religious duty, leading you back into the fear of never being good enough, but you have received the spirit of full acceptance enfolding you into the family of God and you will never feel orphaned for as he rises up within us our spirits join him in saying the words of tender affection beloved father for the Holy Spirit makes God's fatherhood real to us as he whispers into our innermost being you are God's beloved child you are God's beloved child and since we are his true children, we qualify to share all his treasures. For indeed, we are heirs of God himself. And since we are joined to Christ, we also inherit all that he is and all that he has. We will experience being co-glorified with him, provided that we accept his sufferings as our own. To see yourself as beloved of God, you must first believe that God sees you as desirable. If he didn't see you as something desirable, why did he send his son? Why did he allow his son to come and die for us? Because he sees us as desirable. And because he sees me as desirable, because he called me up out of the pit, because he took me from the miry clay and set me upon a rock, because of this great love that God has shed abroad in my heart, I'll serve him all the days of my life. There's nothing I wouldn't do for him. There's nothing I wouldn't say yes to because I understand and know he gave it all. So it's about time we as believers turn, return the favor and say, God, I'm giving you my all. I'm giving you my family. I'm giving you my children. I'm giving you my marriage. I'm giving it all to you and I'm trusting you with the results. And I understand this, that if I seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things shall be given unto me. We have no need to fear when we understand how much God loves us. If you're held in bondage by the fear of the world, by the fear in the shadow of COVID, if you're held in bondage by the fear of the things going on in the world today, let me, let me free you up right now. God's love is bigger than that. God's love is bigger than that. He's looking after your family. He's looking after your kids. He's looking after your finances. Come on, somebody. It's about time we realize who our God is. He's not just some fictional character. He's not just some religious obligation. He is an active in a present help in time of need. He is an active in a present father. Let me tell you something. I just feel something right now by the spirit that if you're watching this and you had a father who stepped out on you, if you had a dad that didn't love you, you do have a father in heaven, a father that sits high above the things of this earth that wants to get involved in your life. 
I have many friends who are in that boat. I have many friends who understand that feeling of not having a father or having a dad who stepped out on them. And let me tell you something. Some of them have the most passionate love affair with Jesus Christ I have ever seen because those who have been forgiven much, those who have been shown much love, love much. And let me tell you something. God wants to do something in your life. He's not throwing you away. He doesn't want you to be bitter. He doesn't want you to hold unforgiveness in your heart. Choose the love. Choose to reciprocate that love that he's given you to others. He wants to minister to you. He wants to change you from the inside out. Why did God choose to conquer death, hell, and the grave through Jesus? Why would he go to the greatest length so that we might know him? Because he sees you as desirable. He sees you uh, in a way that maybe you can't see yourself yet. Choose to see his love. His love was spelled out through sacrifice of himself for you. John 17, 23 was a prayer of Jesus before he went to the cross in the gospel of John. He prayed for you. He prayed for me. He prayed for the believers that were to come because of his sacrifice. And this is what he said. You live fully in me. He's talking to God, the Father. You live fully in me, Father. And now I live fully in them so that they will experience perfect unity with us. And the world will be convinced that you have sent me, for they will see that you love each one of them with the same passionate love that you have for me. Jesus is saying, God has this same passionate love for you as he did his very own son, Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something. The Bible talks about that God is love, that it's who he is. That's who our God is. Now, there are other characteristics of God, but God, one of his characteristics is that he is love, that he is for you and not against you. And you may say, well, how in the world is there even a possibility that I could go to hell? Because there is a chance that you won't accept the love that he has for you. There's a chance that you won't walk in the victory that Jesus has paid for you. There's a chance that you might not accept this gratuitous love that God wants to bring forth to each one of us. But let me tell you, there's no chance in this world, there's no chance that God's love for you is any different. See, we have to understand whether or not we accept this love, whether or not we walk in the victory of this love is up to us. But the fact of God loving you is no question. But will we submit and surrender to him and choose to walk in the victory of his love? Will we allow that love to push us into a place of holiness, making us whole on the inside and then us following him into holiness? This is the love of God, that Jesus Christ died for us while we were still sinners. Before you could ever tell him you loved him, he told you that he loved you. By the shed blood of Jesus, every drop he spilled while his body was being broken, he was thinking about you. Let me tell you something. Many of us have paradigms right now that are listening to this message, and we don't know if that's really true. Let me talk to you about the power of a paradigm. Let me talk to you about how your thinking can keep you locked out of the blessing of God. There was a, a minister that was preaching on the power of a paradigm. This is a true story. And he was preaching on the power of a paradigm, teaching on the power of a paradigm. And at the end of the message, uh, people came up, people were set free, all of those things. But afterwards, he comes off stage and he meets with this woman. This woman was in the audience and she walks up to him and she says, let me tell you about the power of a paradigm in my life. And he said, I would love to hear your story. And so this lady comes up to him and says, you know, my father, when I was growing up, he used to abuse me. He used to call me names. He used to tell me I wasn't good enough. He used to tell me I was stupid. He used to tell me I wasn't beautiful. He used to call me the scum of the earth, that he doesn't even know why I was put on this planet. And she said, there was always one thing that, that made me feel like I wasn't approved by him. There was always one thing that made me want to try to perform and earn his love. And she, he, she said, he would tell me that my eyes, my eyes looked like cat feces that my eyes were the most terrible shade of green he had ever seen, that it was the most disgusting color of green he had ever seen, and that if my eyes were blue, then he would love me. If my eyes were just blue, then he would accept me. And this minister is taken back because he's looking at this woman the whole time, and he says, 
Well, you understand that your eyes are blue, right? That your eyes are blue right now. And she said, yeah, that's the thing. My eyes were blue all along, but I never could see it because of how he spoke over me. And God had to free me from that for me to ever see true beauty in myself. Let me tell you something today. I don't know the type of paradigm you see God's love through today, but while you were still sinning, while you were still not good enough, while you weren't able to do a thing to make you right, God sent his son Jesus Christ to die for you. And today he can make things right. And from that love, you can live a life of victory. I am so sick and tired of seeing Christians walk around in a spirit of defeat. When God uh, gave us the same spirit that rose Jesus Christ from the dead to quicken our mortal, mortal bodies for us to live in the victory of his son. See, we live by the impulses of the spirit. I am driven by love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. God has enlivened me with this spirit and now I'm led by those impulses. And because the Holy Spirit makes God's fatherhood real to me, it's real to me, man. It's real to me. It's real. I understand he loves me. And because of that, from coming from a place of victory, I'm fighting from victory. I'm fighting from a place of being already accepted in the beloved. There's nothing that I can't do. I'm an unstoppable force for the kingdom because I know he loves me and I know he gives me the power to overcome. Do you understand that? Do you see God's love through the right paradigm today? Today, you can make it right. Today, you can understand that Jesus Christ came and died for you, that you can be in right standing with God with no fear, perfect love that casts out fear of judgment because on the final day, God will look at you and he'll see his son. He'll see the blood of Jesus covering you, that your sins are forgiven, and now you can walk in newness of life. But he doesn't just want you to have eternal life someday when, when you go to heaven. He wants you to have abundant life while you're on this earth. He wants you to have an overcoming life while you're on this earth. He wants you to walk in the victory of his son, Jesus Christ, while you're on this earth. Hallelujah. Isn't that a great thing to know? The facts are that you may have had a terrible past, but the truth is God sent Jesus. The facts are you may not have been good enough. The facts are this and that, but the truth is we live by a higher standard. We live by a higher truth that Jesus Christ can, the overcoming power of the blood of Jesus Christ can wash away your sins and help you walk into a place of victory. Come on, I don't know if you're praising God where you are right now, but in my heart, in my body right now, I feel by the Spirit of God that He wants to, to enact victory in your life. And so today, as we begin to close, let's pray that the victory of God would be in our life. Let's pray that we would see that God loves us. And from that love, we could walk into a place of victory over sin, over death, over sickness. I'm telling you, when you choose to walk in His victory, there is nothing impossible for you. Let's pray. God, we come to you today. We pray right now a prayer of repentance. God, shift the way we think. Shift the way we think. We want to see you as you are. That the eyes of love are staring at us. God, I pray that any sin in our hearts, Father God, we repent of it right now. We turn ourselves towards you. We put our trust in you. God, we don't want to do this life by the whims of our will, by the whims of how we feel. We want to live by the impulses of the Spirit, walking with you hand in hand in the cool of the day. God, we want to walk in relationship with you. We want this to be a real thing in our life. God, free us from the fear of religiosity and let us walk into the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. God, I pray that the orphan spirit would be gone in Jesus' name. And I pray that we would walk into the sonship. God, I pray that we would walk in uh, the sonship of, of you, God, of the family of God. Let us understand and know that you love us, God. And today we repent and come into a, a place of surrender to you. And we put our trust in you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. And God bless you. Are you someone who hasn't had a relationship with the Lord? You heard this message today and you just feel compelled to turn your life around and walk with the Lord, to receive Him in your life and to receive Him into your heart. 
If that's you today, I want to encourage you to make a decision for Christ and pray this prayer with me. It's a prayer of salvation. It's not the words I'm saying, but it's the position of your heart, turning away from your old life and into the family of God. So if that's you today, I want you to just pray with me this morning and mean the words of your heart. God, I am choosing you. I am choosing to turn away from the life I have been living. I acknowledge that I have been sinning against you, that I have been living a life that you are not leading. I'm choosing today to walk away from that, to choose you fully, and allow you to lead, direct, and guide my life. I ask you to come into my heart, renew my mind, renew my spirit, and let me walk in a fresh life with you and the things that you have for me. Amen. Giving your life to Jesus is the best decision you can ever make. To take your next steps, text NEXT1 to 94090 and a pastor on staff will get in contact with you. Today we want to encourage you to be a giver. You know, I really believe that the Lord takes joy when we are joyful about giving. You know, his word says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave his only begotten son. Our God is generous. And that same generosity should be prevalent in the lives of those that follow him. And today we want to encourage you to do that. To attach yourself, your resources, to the vision of the church. The very institution that God set in place to enact his kingdom. The very thing God set in place to move forward and advance his kingdom. When you sow your money, when you put faith in attaching yourself to the kingdom of God, the, the fruit that we reap as a church is in direct effect because of you. The money that we're able to give uh, uh, to students to have backpacks, the, the, the amount of money we were able to give to people who were without jobs over COVID-19, all the different things, it's because we're obeying God. It's because we're attaching our resources to what it is He wants to do. So today we wanna encourage you to do that. You can see the ways to give below. Thank you so much for being generous, church. God bless you. Today, if you'll just raise your hands as to receive a blessing, I'll pray a blessing over you, then we will be dismissed. God, we come to you this morning. We're so thankful for who you are. And we pray right now that the Lord will bless you and keep you, that he'll cause his face to shine upon you, that he will uh, turn his grace towards you and give you peace and grace in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Have a great day. We'll see you next week. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Summit Church. My name is Trayla, and I serve here on our women's ministry team. We are so glad you decided to join us this weekend. If you are new with us or want to stay connected here at Summit, text NEXT1 to 94090, and a pastor on staff will contact you and help you get connected. Church, we are so excited to have Jump Kids and Jump Junior back. So come early this Sunday to check your kids in. It's going to be a blast. If you've enjoyed your time so far here at Summit and want to make Summit your church home, you should join us for Summit Next. Summit Next is made up of four experiences that happen each week here at Summit. It is designed to strengthen your relationship with God, share how we operate as a church, and to help you reach your full potential. If you are wanting to start Summit Next, text NEXT1 to 94090 and a pastor on staff will help you start your journey. Our small groups here at Summit have launched back and you can be a part. Small groups here at Summit are so fun and edifying. Groups are a great way to get plugged in and find community. If you want to join a small group, you can see our full list of groups on our website.
Church, thank God for today's message. We hope it has encouraged you. If you would like to take your next steps at Summit, text NEXT1 to 94090 and a pastor will get in contact with you. By texting NEXT1, it allows you to make a decision for Christ, be water baptized, join a small group, connect with the church, or sign up for Summit Next. All you have to do is text NEXT1 to 94090 and you will be connected with a pastor on staff here at Summit. Church, we are continuing our 21 days of fasting and prayer. For more information on the ways you can fast, you can visit our website. We are having worship and prayer nights at 6 p.m. tonight and next Sunday night. Let's gather our friends and family and lift up the name of Jesus. Church, we are praying for you and so thankful that you joined us online today.